Hi, I'm Rachel and welcome to my 2023 favorite books list slash 2024 anticipated reads list. This is the video I'm always excited to start out the new year with. I'm going to say we're still very much in the beginning of the new year, if not, you know, exactly the very start of the new year. I am still wearing this flamingo shirt to celebrate, so there's that. And anyway, uh, I'm just excited to share some thoughts with you. I uh, have three books that I'm going to highlight as my favorite uh, reads of 2023. And then I always get very ambitious and excited and I have a list of nine books that I'm anticipating in the first six months of 2024. <laughs> So without further ado, I'm going to get into things, and I'm going to start with uh, highlighting some of my favorite reads, and admittedly, uh, what I'm putting in my third place, or my runners-up place, I suppose it is, is a little bit of a cheat, uh, because this book is a reread, and it's already been on my favorites list for a few years now, but I just can't uh, deny how much I'm in love with The Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes by Suzanne Collins. I just love the whole Hunger Games world and what Suzanne Collins is doing with it. And I particularly love how she wanted to go back into the past and um, really analyze how someone like Corio, who would become the villain and president of the main series, would be turned uh, as a young man toward uh, fascist thinking. And also it uh, aligns a lot with um, how the games uh, turned into a spectacle and uh, were part of um, sort of the renaissance, a very dark renaissance of capital culture from this really um, uh, dilapidated and scarred, uh, you know, city that was still suffering from the after effects in a lot of ways of uh, the uh, Civil War. Uh, that it, the Dark Days Civil War that it had been a part of 10 years earlier uh, and uh, the games were something that were made into a propaganda piece in large part uh, to uh, start up uh, the capital infrastructure and economics again and while at the same time being used as a psychological uh, tool of fascism to uh, keep the districts down. Uh, and so, yeah, there's just um, so much at play here, and uh, reading it shortly before the uh, movie adaptation came out uh, was a lot of fun for the process of, you know, comparing and contrasting to the adaptation. And it also was really meaningful to me to read the book um, when there's so much uh, strife and uh, war happening uh, in the world right now, and particularly uh, what was happening and is, continues to happen in Israel and Gaza. What Suzanne Ch Collins always does for me is uh, challenges me and really uh, forces me to look at uh, these forces and how they act upon people and uh, the fears and uh, uh, bigotries of society and um, how complicated these issues of, um, of warfare and uh, psychological trauma can really be. Uh, so, uh, you know, Suzanne and I are very tight in our one-sided relationship. I um, am just very much in love with her books and her messages that she's trying to put together in her books. And uh, I uh, would read uh, anything else, especially, I think, in uh, YA or adult that she would uh, ever come out with. And just to put it out there, to give a little bit of a shout out to Lucy Gray Baird, the District 12 tribute who challenges Corio the most in a romantic plot line to uh, possibly uh, take a step back from fascism and think a bit bigger about the world. Uh, one of the things I love most about her, this character is her fierce devotion to her uh, country Appalachia music and to her Covey tribe. And it's probably also one of my favorite things about uh, the uh, movie adaptation is the way that they were able to incorporate that music. Okay, and moving into new reads that I can add to my favorite reads list. Uh, in second place, I'm going with uh, Thistlefoot by Jenna Rose Nethercott, which is backlist, but, uh, you know, I tend to read mostly backlist anyway. Uh, and... Uh, this is a uh, magical realist uh, fantasy novel, uh, which uh, is a retelling of sorts of the Baba Yaga myths of um, Russia 
uh, and putting them into a uh, Jewish context. Uh, so the story mostly takes place in the modern day. We're following two uh, siblings, the Yaga siblings, uh, Bellatine, who is a uh, woodworker, and Isaac, who is this street performer and kind of a con artist. They both have some magical properties that they uh, either are using or denying in their uh, everyday lives. Uh, and uh, they're just sort of uh, trying to live uh, quiet lives of a sort and make it in the world when they are randomly bequeathed an object from a distant uh, ancestor, the Baba Yaga, from, uh, from uh, Russia. Uh, well, she had died at the uh, beginning of the 20th century and uh, bequeathed this item to her, uh, you know, uh, descendants in the, you know, early 21st century. And this item was a house on chicken legs. Uh, this world, uh, in general, uh, beyond the house on chicken legs, there's an understanding in uh, Jenna Rose Nethercott's world that there are uh, magical items that are sort of... Um, influenced by trauma and she goes into specific uh, examples like especially having to do with American history since the novel takes place in America but her main focus is on uh, Jewish Ashkenazi trauma uh, as the Bellatine uh, siblings uh, interact with this house and their first thought is that they are going to turn the house into a sort of traveling road show and they're going to put on a puppet show which is part of their family history as well to make some money but as they start to interact with the house their magic uh, becomes uh, more uh, defined and they have to uh, confront things about their personal and familial pasts and trauma and meanwhile an uh, enemy also uh, unknowingly uh, to begin with comes across the sea as well with the house on chicken legs. The long shadow man is a supernatural sort of enemy that preys on uh, human fears and bigotries. And his main purpose is to erase communal past and uh, to erase, uh, you know, uh, humans and their history. Uh, and particularly in this case, there's a lot of focus on uh, erasing uh, Jewish history and that uh, he was part of uh, the reason that um, a pogrom uh, started uh, that uh, destroyed the Baba Yaga and her community uh, in, in the Russian Empire. Uh, so that's the gist of the story. It's also told in such a beautiful, haunting, poetic style since Nethercott herself is a poet. I just was completely uh, drawn into the language and really drawn into how she uh, dealt with uh, trauma, generational trauma, and how it goes down through the centuries and can impact people specifically, uh, granted in a magical realist sort of way where Isaac and Bellatine's powers are, you know, magical and supernatural, but connected to real trauma that uh, people can face in their lives. Uh, so it felt like a, a song of my people in uh, some sort of way. I know that uh, for Nethercott, it really uh, did uh, draw from a lot of influences from uh, her family's past in uh, the Russian Empire. Um, there are also parts of the book that do go back to the past and um, narrate the Baba Yaga's life, largely told from the perspective of the House on Chicken Legs. And there's always some questions about sort of the veracity of uh, what the house is telling us. And I think that ties in so beautifully to some of the whimsical writings of past uh, Yiddish uh, writers, like Sholem Alechem really came to mind for me. And so that was an extra oomph of uh, really feeling that nostalgic pull to this culture, uh, and never mind this culture that uh, the long shadow man and uh, people, you know, influenced by fear and bigotry were trying to erase. So it was just a beautiful uh, and ultimately, I think, very hopeful read about um, how to deal with this trauma and to have it inform parts of you and also be able to move on from it. And finally, in first place, uh, I am putting something I pretty much uh, was not surprised to put in first place, a 2023 release, A Day of Fallen Night by Samantha Shannon, which was a prequel novel to The Priory of the Orange Tree, which is also on my favorites list. 
Uh, and this is also a fantasy novel uh, getting into epic secondary world fantasy, uh, a, a feminist retelling of uh, the St. George and the Dragon story uh, taking place in a world where there are Eastern dragons and Western dragons that mean very different things. The Eastern dragons are revered gods who largely help people out uh, when they can to sort of keep the balance in the world, and then the Western dragons are creatures of uh, demonic uh, power. <laughs> and so in Priory, the original novel, we're sort of um, dealing with a end of day scenario where the uh, nameless one, the worst of the worst uh, dragons or worms as they're called, comes back and the world has to come together to defeat him. But there was a tease in that novel that, that 500 years before there was a little slight uprising like where one of the generals, uh, general uh, worms of the nameless one was able to come back and wreak havoc for a little while. And that's what this book covers uh, in a similar sprawling length, which really lends itself to the amount of maximist world building that I absolutely love. And again, we're following multiple protagonists uh, spanning from different parts of this imagined world. Um, so um, the first uh, character we're following is a uh, uh, is Tanuva, who is a middle-aged uh, woman from the Priory, and she and her uh, wife are trying to keep the Priory together uh, during a time of peace when maybe some of the younger folks are questioning uh, the need for the Priory. And meanwhile, she also has a dark secret about a lost child that, you know, uh, plays out throughout the rest of the book about what happened to him. Uh, then, um, in uh, the West, there is uh, the Queendom of Innes, uh, where we're following mostly uh, the Queen Glorian, who uh, lived for a long time in the shadow of her very uh, charismatic uh, parents, who really uh, ushered um, uh, their um, respective kingdom and queendom through uh, eras of peace. Uh, but they are uh, destroyed uh, when, uh, you know, the um, warfare with the worms starts and uh, Glorian is sort of thrust into a leadership role uh, and uh, what she's going to do with that. And also she's, I think, you know, a kind of like an older teenager at the time. But uh, in the East, we have like a 20-something uh, uh priestess called Dumai who uh, lives in a mountain temple in the east and is trying to sort of quietly help bring the gods back to life, uh, wake them up as it were, and uh, she is then embroiled into new plots when uh, her father's identity is revealed to be um, a noble, someone in charge of a kingdom, and uh, she has to uh, take her place by his side and is thus around when um, the world is put into peril by uh, the arrival of the worms. So yeah, there are high stakes, but for me, I love the pacing where there's so much uh, time taken with building up all of these like lush characters and secondary characters and how rich all of the world building feels. You know, some people I think are like, you know, let's get to the point already. But for me, I just loved swimming in this world. I actually feel like, um, the Priory and the East were more um, explored and probably a stronger part of this book than Priory of the Orange Tree itself. So that uh, in that way, it was an improvement. And uh, I really, really enjoyed myself uh, with this story and how much it felt like completely jumping into a lush, lavish, expansive fantasy world. I mean, it's a chunkster. It took a lot of time to read it, uh, but it's a reminder to me how big books can, in fact, be worth it, because especially in epic fantasy, they can push a lot of my personal buttons about uh, uh, exploring these themes of uh, fellowship and uh, fighting uh, like a big evil where um, the human beings are complex and have like more nuance to their societies. Um, and just getting all of that into one epic tome is just something, I guess, especially with Shannon's world building uh, that I really appreciated. It's the sort of thing that would make a wonderful adaptation, I think, to the, the grand screen. And uh, who knows, maybe she's not done with this world yet. Maybe there's another 800-page tome where she could 
you know, officially describe the St. George and the Dragon story, although I think part of the um, allure of um, that is how different people uh, in and how different uh, societies uh, interpret that myth in the West or how the East has their own uh, mythology as well that uh, is, uh, was really fun to follow. So yeah, I think my favorites really catered toward sprawling, epic, fantastical uh, explorations of culture in a way, even when there are some magical stakes uh, abounding as well. Uh, in the new year, I'm certainly hoping to read more fantasy that touches me in the same way, but I'm also hoping that uh, other genres work for me as well and that I find some great new favorites for 2024. And uh, now I'm going to transition to my list of nine, which hopefully some of them might make that distinction. So I'm going to start with the first one coming out on January 9th. It is The Amen Effect. Ancient Wisdom to Mend Our Broken Hearts and World by Rabbi Saren Browse. I do enjoy, I think, some of the first nonfiction I uh, gravitate to every year is uh, uh, Jewish nonfiction put out by uh, rabbis, although I think uh, her uh, themes that she'll be discussing in uh, this book are a little more universal, whereas usually I gravitate towards something more specifically Jewish. But in this case, I'm particularly drawn to... Uh, uh, Sharon Browse, uh, who I've known about for a long time uh, as a progressive uh, rabbi. Uh, but I recently heard her on the Ezra Klein show uh, with some really uh, moving commentary for me where I felt really heard and challenged about uh, the Israel-Hamas war. And so that's how she kind of uh, came back onto my radar with just... Uh, the commentary that uh, she and Ezra talked about, I'll link to the podcast down below, and really um, reinvigorated my interest in her stance uh, on uh, philosophical and moral matters. So uh, I do feel like uh, this would be um, a compelling uh, piece of uh, literature. Next, on uh, January 16th, we have City of Laughter by Timon Fruchter. Uh, I'm really hoping this one's coming out because I know she uh, has a uh, appearance scheduled at a local DC bookstore uh, coming up soon, so hopefully she'll have a book to go with it. Uh, speaking of uh, fiction that uh, might uh, delve a little bit into the uh, magical realist sort of folklorist uh, fiction, uh, this is a story that uh, starts, I guess, in the present where a queer Jewish woman decides to travel back to her family's uh, ancestral home in Poland uh, to sort of uh, deal with uh, generational issues. Uh, and I believe once she gets there, she um, gets in touch with um, an 18th century uh, storyline uh, uh, steeped in uh, Jewish folklore. So it's one of these uh, novels that sort of... Uh, you know, toes the line, or blurs the line, I should say, between reality and fantasy. Now I'm going to skip past February entirely and go into March, uh, and on March 12th, uh, we have a historical fiction novel coming out called In the Shadow of the Greenbrier by Emily Mokhtar, and uh, this is about a uh, Jewish-American family who, for four generations, um, has uh, been in charge of this West Virginia uh, resort or hotel, and it's about the family grappling uh, with um, their place and their identity. And the story starts in uh, 1942 with a young mother escaping a stifling marriage, and uh, then uh, jumps to her daughter 17 years later trying to uh, fit in, uh, but then a uh, handsome stranger comes to town, it looks like, and uh, that'll uh, stir some things up there. Also on March 12th, we have Jump Notes by Hao Jianfang coming out. Uh, it's a translated book, translated from the Chinese by Ken Liu. I've read one of Hao Jianfang's uh, science fiction works uh, before, and it's a challenging work, I think, uh, in the uh, way that she tells the story. But uh, I can't help but be intrigued uh, by this promise of first contact, uh, where the world is going to be divided into two factions, uh, the Pacific League of Nations and the Atlantic Division of Nations. 
and particularly to get it from a Chinese viewpoint, which is still more rare for me than getting the American viewpoint into science fiction issues. So uh, yeah, I think this will be a uh, exciting uh, jump into 2024 uh, science fiction for me. I love the idea of uh, first contact and uh, hopefully it'll go well for us. <laughs> And finally, on March 12th, a very busy time for me, apparently, uh, we have the novel Mother Doll by Katya Apekina. Uh, this is another uh, Jewish intergenerational tale told from a uh, Soviet American perspective um, for generations of mothers and daughters, uh, starting with um, a young pregnant woman in Los Angeles. Uh, and she has some trauma going on with that because her husband doesn't actually want the baby. And meanwhile, her Russian grandmother and favorite person in the world is dying on the opposite coast. Uh, and um, things continue from there when she, after she gets a call from a psychic medium uh, with a message from the other side. So again, I think there's going to be some ghosts in this and a little bit of the blurring of the line between reality and fantasy as we get into uh, familial and cultural issues. Moving just a week later into March 19th, we have The Hebrew Teacher, three novellas by Maya Arad. This will be translated from the Hebrew by Jessica Cohen. Uh, and I'm excited to get into a new form, into novellas. Uh, and I was particularly excited about uh, the uh, premise that these uh, novellas would follow the lives of three Israeli women who immigrate to the U.S. This seems mostly grounded in realism, talking about uh, issues of uh, workplace uh, drama, dealing with, um, you know, colleagues with maybe different political views or family members who are estranged uh, and uh, dealing also with the realities of uh, social media. So uh, I'm really uh, excited uh, to get into uh, these issues. And uh, usually I feel like uh, realism is my... Uh, wheelhouse when it comes to uh, literary fiction. I, I tend to think of myself as having a big divide, like either I'm into, you know, the epic fantasy and sci-fi or I'm into realist fiction. So this will, you know, scratch that realist fiction bug, I think, uh, and hopefully have some deep character studies as well. Okay. Uh, but speaking of uh, Jewish fantasy, uh, in April we're moving forward with The Familiar by Lee Bardugo, which is something that really excites me because I tend to keep my uh, eye on uh, Jewish-inspired fantasy, and it seems like some of the big fantasy authors, the Jewish fantasy authors, are starting to get into it more and write um, stories that are much more related uh, specifically or explicitly to uh, Jewish history. And The Familiar is um, a fantasy story that takes place in our world, uh, but it takes place around the Spanish Inquisition. And uh, what Bardugo has said is that it's based a little bit on her own family history. So yeah, more specifically, it's um, about uh, Luzia, a, a servant in a household of an impoverished Spanish nobleman. Uh, she has a talent for little miracles. Uh, which her uh, social climbing mistress demands she uses uh, in her favor. But um, Luzia is worried about um, her hidden Jewish ancestry, as uh, I think uh, the Inquisition is starting to pick up. But not all fantasy I read is uh, Jewish fantasy. So uh, skipping over to uh, April 30th, we have Relics of Ruin by Erin M. Evans, which is also a sequel novel. Uh, I read her uh, Empire of Exiles uh, last year, and I really loved it how the secondary world uh, is uh, based uh, upon the idea of um, refugees, uh, sort of uh, making this uh, empire together uh, because uh, they all come from uh, lands that have been overrun by these uh, changeling creatures. But the major thrust of the first novel was about a sort of a murder mystery plot and sort of political machinations plot uh, and uh, trying to, you know, uncover that mystery. But from the uh, focal point of uh, working in an archives. Uh, and the archives are also very magical. The magical system is based on sort of uh, anxiety magic, where the uh, archivists have um, an affinity 
for specific elements as they're dealing with relics from their world, but if they go too deep into the magic of the elements, they could lose themselves. Uh, and there's particularly this head archivist who's this really nurturing middle-aged uh, character with a, you know, secret past, uh, but uh, it's fun to see a uh, nurturing middle-aged uh, character like that in a work situation as well. And uh, there was also a, a young scribe who was sort of unwittingly uh, uh, cast into these uh, political machinations and joins them. Uh, and it was just a bunch of fun, and I love the world building, and I'm eager to see where the story goes next. And finally, rounding out things in the beginning of May, on May 7th, we have The Mother of All Things by Alexis Landau. Alexis Landau is also a repeat author for me. Uh, Several years back, uh, I think I called Empire of the Senses my favorite read of that year when I read it, which was a World War I historical novel following a uh, Jewish-German family uh, and uh, their service in World War I. And then as, and as things start to get more dangerous for them and other Jews in Germany uh, leading up to uh, Hitler's ascent to power. Uh, and then her second book actually was more explicitly World War II fiction, and I decided not to pick it up because I try not to read too much World War II and Holocaust stuff. But with this book, I believe she is coming to the present day of a sort. <laughs> Although, like a lot of my stories, there seems to be a little bit of a blurring of the lines. <laughs> So in The Mother of All Things, of our protagonist's, uh, I think, professional life is kind of put on hold because of her uh, husband's uh, pursuits. Uh, she kind of has to take on most of the parenting stuff. Uh, and for one summer film shoot in Bulgaria, she follows her husband there and has a chance encounter with a fierce feminist mentor from college. And I believe she's swept up into a circle of women they reenact some Greco-Roman female rights, uh, which I'm not sure, I don't necessarily think we're actually traveling back to the past uh, literally, but obviously there's something figurative going on and uh, it um, sort of illuminates sort of the intersection of uh, where she is in her own life as a woman. Um, and it talks about sort of uh, ideas of womanhood across time. So yeah, from a feminist perspective, uh, this interests me, maybe from an academic perspective, she, since uh, this is about history uh, and culture, uh, this also interests me. And since I had some great luck with Alexis Landau in the past, I'm looking forward to giving her another chance. So that about covers it for me now. I will leave the Goodreads links for all the books I mentioned listed down below and the reviews uh, for my favorite uh, reads of 2023. I'd love to hear your thoughts about the books of 2024 that have caught your interest or uh, if any of the books I mentioned have done so. Um, and my battery is waning here, having some uh, uh, camera problems again, much like I did at the beginning of uh, last year, hoping that's not a bad sign or anything. But uh, in the meantime, if all, everything goes well, expect me back on this channel in the near future. I think I'm going to go ahead and do my booktube spin, which is my quarterly TBR game. Now that we're in the beginning of a new year, it's time to put a new book on my uh, TBR from that, so stay tuned. And I hope you are all having a great start to the beginning of uh, 2024, reading and otherwise. Thanks so much for watching, everyone. And I'll see you next time.